So our next um, speaker is for Fine Gael and it's Deputy Carol McNeil and I believe you have 10 minutes. Thank you and uh, thank you Ms Buckley and the HSE staff for, for coming today. Um, can I just ask a couple of quick questions uh, to Ms Buckley, just to clarify some figures for me please. How many centres do you have operating now and how many did you have before? Um, <laughs> it's a kind of a movable feast because we closed one centre over the weekend for the same reason we, we stopped using it earlier in the, the season. We currently have residents in 84 locations. That includes um, 47 direct provision centres, um, I'll have to get the figures out because it, it does change regularly, um, 33 that are emergency accommodation, we have five that are self or four self-isolating facilities and five other facilities that we're using for density reduction. Um, so it's a total at the moment of 84 centres. Okay, and how many, um, can you just confirm the total number of residents then in that, including the number that have permission to resign, re reside? Um, we have nearly, a th nearly just short of a thousand, something like 988 people with permission to reside. Um, and I should just say that obviously there would be more, but for the fact that we've had to. Uh, oh, I know. Yeah, but just the total number, including that. Uh, we have 7,700 residents in uh, that are uh, in the asylum process or post the asylum process, and a further 250 who are refugees who live in what are called our EROCs, but we're treating them identically to direct provision centres for now. And you relocated about 600 of that number? To we re relocated about 600 of that number over the course of two and a half weeks. Okay, that's fine. Um, can I just check with you? We have a report here to the committee on the, um, from the HPSC on the outbreaks of, in vulnerable population settings. And with respect to direct provision centres, it says that there was 14 outbreaks in direct, direct provision centres notified. Um, in, of that, 175 cases were linked to those outbreaks. Is that your information, or is, is that the total number of cases in direct provision centres, or is it more than that? Is the 175 just linked to the outbreaks? Um, Deputy, unfortunately, I, I can't um, verify those figures. Perhaps somebody from the HSE could verify it. Um, they're actually different to what we, we know, mm -hmm. so um, I, I might have to pass that to my colleagues. Yeah, because just in the interest of time, if somebody from the HSE could, could perhaps answer that, please. Yeah, so the, the HPSE, so it's just, it, my question is, 175 cases, it says, are linked to the outbreaks, to the 14 out clusters, but my question is, is that, the to is that the universe of cases in direct vision centres, or is that the number of cases that are linked to the outbreaks, and in fact, is there a different number, and what is that number? It, well... Almost certainly, it, it's very close to the total because it, it would be uncommon for there not to be an outbreak once you've had a case, we would know about it. So I would say, that is explicitly to the 14 outbreaks. I doubt if there is many more than that, but I can't tell you explicitly. It's because of the way the information comes and particularly it would be difficult to say in terms of the people who are living in some of the other accommodation that... Uh, Una has spoken about, which would not be as easily identified for us as being direct provision services. So it is that is ex at the moment the figure there is explicitly what we know about. It is a little bit troubling that we don't have a number for the number of people who have been identified as having COVID-19 in these centres. Shall I take it that this is the is the is the correct number? Do you want to come back and clarify that to the committee later? Come back and let you know if that's not so. But I would imagine it is. Okay, and then of that number, then just um, you know, it's that there are 13 of those people were hospitalised. That there were no intensive care admissions and no deaths. Is that consistent with your information? Yes. Okay. Thank you. It's important to note this would be both uh, residents and staff. Both residents and staff, not identify in outbreaks such as this. They would include both residents and staff. Do you think you could provide then to the committee by way of correspondence a number of residents who have? If that comes out clearly from the data, yes, we will provide that. Thank you. Um, just in relation to uh, some of the information from the Refugee Council did a survey in relation to um, how people had experienced it. And there's a couple of, of just interesting findings. 83% uh, of respondents said that they didn't have access to information about the pandemic. And I appreciate that there will, in certain circumstances, be... Uh, language issues or other, you know, communication barriers. But I do see, Ms. Buckley, about the, the level of effort that you've put into communicating about the pandemic. And I also look, if those figures are correct, it seems to have 
you know, it seems, and again, this isn't my information, but it seems to have gone okay. Can you just give some information about the particular efforts that you've put into communicating the public health advice to people in these environments, please? Uh, thank you, Deputy. So from the get-go, we knew that communicating with centre managers and with the residents of centres was going to be one of the biggest challenges that we would have. And so we established a new team drawn from staff from across the department uh, who volunteered actually to come across um, and set up a system whereby, firstly, we rang on a daily basis every centre manager and asked for information on how things were progressing and what they needed. For example, if they needed PPE or whatever. So we were getting direct information from the centre managers. We also started doing uh, centre newsletters, initially for centre managers, going out about twice or three times a week, and we then started doing one for centre residents, which went out at least once a week, but more commonly than that. And that provides a great deal of information, in uh, and often in many languages, for the centre residents. Um, obviously, we have multiple languages and people with multiple levels of capacity in languages in our centres who are very conscious of that, so we tend to try and get as many communications as possible published in the major languages. Um, but I'm sure we don't get it to everybody every time, I'm, I'm, and we need to keep, um, we will continue to do that and continue to keep pushing information into our centres. One of the recent innovations, we asked centre managers to set up um, WhatsApp broadcasts for all their residents. So broadcast is a more secure way of sending information out, but that they could send information directly into the phones of residents as they come through. And it's so it's through constant efforts, constant reminding, constant reiteration, um, and also just making sure that the centre managers themselves are putting up appropriate signage and, and so on and so forth. So we, we, we continue to do that on a daily basis. And I just clarify, Ms Buckley, then, it, you know, that, that sounds like that's coming a lot from the department. Can I just understand the relationship then in terms of lead responsibility between the department and the HSE, especially at the early stages for providing this guidance and just how that relationship has worked and perhaps you both, might both very comment very briefly on any lessons learned from, from, from that experience? Um, well, I, I should say that, look, we, we have been very reliant on the HSE and they have done uh, a huge amount of work with us and for us in terms of helping us manage the population. And, and as uh, Dr Keller has said, thankfully, that has led to a situation where we haven't had a single serious case of COVID in, in our centres, which is so far, touch wood, long may it remain. Um, I think one of the lessons that we've learned is that um, before the pandemic, um, uh, health services were provided to residents of centres in the same way as they provided to all citizens of this country. So um, asylum seekers get a, a medical card and they access GP services in that way. And then we were reliant on national advice from the National Social Inclusion Office. I think while that system was perfectly uh, adequate, possibly with the exception of mental health, but perfectly adequate for normal health needs of residents in normal times, as our population is reasonably young and reasonably healthy, um, it probably isn't enough at this time. And I have written to the HSE, to colleagues, uh, of, to a colleague of, of uh, Ms McArdle, um, seeking for, uh, for the HSE to review the types of supports that they offer uh, to vulnerable persons, including direct provision centres at this time, Just whether nationally or regionally. And I think that that would be, that certainly is a lesson that we've learned. Okay, and in the interest of the time for the committee, I wonder, is that correspondence that could be shared with the committee for the, for the transparency of the committee? Um, I'd be happy to share my letter. I haven't yet received a reply. I'm sure it's under preparation, but um, I'm happy to share my letter, no problem. Is, is there anything that the HSE would wish to say on the lessons learned in the relationship and how things have been? So, so um, even prior to the, the onset of the COVID pandemic, there has been a very uh, robust and um, integrated engagement between the HSE and the International Protection Accommodation Service, IPAS, under the governance of the Department of Justice, um, working closely together to provide um, health guidance and supports to new arrivals into the country, as well as providing public health information and linking people into the health supports in their communities, wherever those communities may be. In response to the COVID pandemic, or even in advance of that, um, there has been an increased level of meeting, um, meetings and actual measures taken at national level and at local level. So at local level in each uh, community healthcare organisation, our, our social inclusion services work within primary care services to ensure that every resident in direct provision um, receive all the information required to support their health outcomes. At a practical level, that means engaging people in with their GP services and the wide range of...
Henry. Thank you. So, sorry, just in the interest of my, my time, I only have a 30 seconds left. I just wanted to ask the department one more thing. I'm terribly sorry to interrupt you. Um, but there's just one other question. The, as I understand it, Ms Buckley, that, you know, obviously there haven't been new cases presenting to Ireland in the way that there had been or at the rate that there had been. Is there, you know, what steps are the department taking now to use what might be described as a, as a lull or a pause in new applications to try to expedite the processing of existing ap uh, applications or, or have you been hampered in that way because of the courts? The, so no. in point of fact, Deputy, um, 773 people presented looking for international protection over the course of the first few months of this year. Now the numbers have fallen off in the last month or so, but we were still getting a steady stream of people applying for international protection and seeking to access the accommodation services up certainly to the middle of April. Um, so I just want to point that out. And as soon as uh, any travel restrictions emerge, that, that, that flow will happen again. We have consistently allowed people to apply for asylum. We have never stopped that. However, we have had to restrict a lot of access to our buildings. And unfortunately, the Department of Justice systems are largely paper-based, so it has very much restricted our capacity to take decisions. And we're currently planning very actively for a resumption of that work which should allow us to start to resume taking decisions, and particular positive decisions that will allow people, we hope, uh, the opportunity to move, uh, to move on with their lives. Thank you.